Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. The oldest of my three sisters had three Victorian looking porcelain dolls from one of her family members. Anytime I would be in her room, it was always freezing and just looking at the dolls gave me the heebie-jeebies. My sister moved out of the room and went off to college. She didn't want the dolls to get damaged, so she left them in the bedroom. I didn't know this, so I moved into that room. At the time this happened, I was in sixth grade and that's when my school district opened band up as a class. I decided I wanted to play trombone, and so I did. I always had the instrument in its case against a wall. The entire thing in its case weighed about 10 elbs. A few nights after I moved into the room, one of the dolls shifted. It was the creepiest one. She had dark hair and a dark red dress. When she leaned to the side, my trombone fell over, even though it was about three in the morning and I was scared out of my mind. I got out of bed, picked my trombone back up, and went back to bed. The next night, the same thing happened, but this time the trombone was pushed five feet into the middle of my room. After it stopped, my fan that I always had on a low setting just stopped, and almost right after that, all of the papers and homework on my desk flew off. I was scared shitless, but I picked my bedroom up and went back to bed. The next night and every night after that, I would wake up at about four in the morning to some invisible force sitting on the side of my bed and stroking my hair. My door was always closed so that my cats couldn't get in. And there's no way my fan could have caused this. I was constantly trying to debunk it. Then we moved the dolls to the basement. We had an Xbox in the basement and whenever I would game with my friends, I'd always feel like I was being watched. Then it started playing with my hair. I even had a friend over and she got grabbed. We have since moved and I have no idea where the doll ended up, but I'm sure as hell glad that they're not where I live anymore. I would like to preface this by saying that I live in a house that was built in 1957. It belongs to my husband's grandmother and before her, it belonged to her parents. It has some history. A few years ago, an old man or family friend lived with us who had lung cancer, and ultimately he died here. To my knowledge, no one else has physically died in the house, but the majority of my husband's family members are no longer with us. I constantly feel like someone is watching me. I have also had several instances where I thought I saw something moving out of the corner of my eye, but when I looked in that direction, nothing was there. I am a skeptic, who wants to believe in the paranormal, but I've never witnessed anything significant enough to completely push me to that point. Tonight, I was sitting in my bedroom playing a game on my phone. I always keep my door shut, and my dog is usually in the room with me. When she's not, it's not long before she's standing outside my door, waiting to be let in. She did that tonight, but I was preoccupied, so I didn't let her in right away. I was looking at my phone when I heard the doorknob rattle and then the door opened. When I looked up, my daughter was going into the bathroom, which is right next to my room, so I figured she must have opened it on her way in, and I didn't think much of it. When she got out of the bathroom, I asked her if she had let the dog in, and she said no. My daughter isn't the kind to lie about something so trivial. My husband was across the house in the kitchen, and his grandma was fast asleep in her bedroom. At first, I thought maybe the door wasn't shut all the way, and that my dog must have nudged it open with her nose. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that if that were the case, the doorknob wouldn't have rattled like someone turned it. I tested this theory by moving the door back and forth. I couldn't replicate the noise without turning the knob. When I brought it up to my husband, he told me that the other night his grandma was going to grab something off her nightstand. But when she went to reach for it, moments later, it was in a different spot. 
Some other things have happened in the past that were also a little peculiar. Two examples. His uncle lived here and passed away at a nearby hospital before we moved here. But his mom, my husband's grandma, left his room as it was for years after he passed. He and my husband were very close. One night, when he was visiting his grandma, he went to his uncle's room, shut the door, and laid on his bed. He described hearing knocking on the walls all around him, even though no one else was anywhere near the room. After the old man family friend, I mentioned earlier passed away, I had a dream about him that felt more like a message he was trying to send me for my husband's grandma. He looked a lot healthier than I had ever seen him, and he told me that he was at peace, and that he still loved her. He always loved her. He always loved her in a romantic way, even though for her it was purely platonic. The things described in this post still aren't obvious, transparent or frequent enough to make me fully commit to the idea that the house is haunted. But they definitely make me wonder. The events in this story took place somewhere between 1988 and 1995. It's hard to say exactly when because my husband and I moved several times prior to buying our house. And some of those apartments have blurred together. Not this one though. Built in 1930, the building in which this apartment was and is located is situated just east of Halsted, the main street of Chicago's Boys Town. Though from the outside, it looks like thousands of other buildings. It holds a unique place in the city's domestic history, having once served as an apartment hotel, IA, a residence with amenities. That means in its earliest incarnation, it had a front desk overlooking a plushly decorated lobby from which clerks greeted visitors and provided services such as sending and receiving laundry, dry cleaning, mail, and packages, and accepting deliveries from grocery stores and nearby restaurants. Also, as in a hotel, there was a dedicated cleaning staff that dusted, vacuumed, and straightened your rooms daily. For its era, this was considered the ultimate in modern urban living. Unfortunately, the depression killed the apartment hotel concept because people couldn't afford the extras anymore. As a result, the clerks and cleaners were let go. The lobby grew shabby and the building began a long, slow slide into obscurity. By the 1940s and 1950s, it had downgraded to flop houses status as a place where men down on their luck could rent mattresses on the floor for $1 a night. It continued to serve that population until gentrification brought it back into use as apartments in the early 80s. Not being from the area, I didn't recognize the building for what it had been during its downtrodden years, but my husband, who grew up nearby, did. Imagine asking $800 a month to live in a flop house. He declared when we viewed the place, but we ended up taking the apartment anyway because of its charming vintage features which included a set of tall casement windows in the living room, a cute little dine-in kitchen with bookshelves for my cookbooks, and best of all, a huge dressing room with, built, in shelving, shoe racks, and three full-length mirrors. Once we moved in, however, we discovered our new home also had drawbacks, including a party-line phone setup, into which our service was connected despite the fact we were paying for a private number after we notified the phone company. It took them weeks to straighten out the buildings. Entangled lines. There was also an ancient elevator that ran, apparently of its own volition all night. I'd sometimes get up for a midnight snack and hear it shuttling nonstop up and down the shaft that ran behind our kitchen wall. But those were nothing compared to what came next. A few months later, we discovered we had a third tenant in our unit and not one of the living or breathing kind. I first encountered him one evening when, while cooking at the stove in the tiny kitchen, I felt someone come up behind me, thinking it was my husband, the only other person around at the time. I anticipated a hug plus the usual query, when's dinner going to be ready? But when neither of those came, I turned around and saw a man in a long wool coat, his fedora pulled low, standing right behind me. Grayish in color and with no discernible features, he stayed for maybe two seconds, then disappeared. 
Was I scared? Not really. I guess all the years of hearing my mom talk about various spirits she'd seen prepared me. Plus, I'd already had a prior experience of my own. See my post about the bedside visitor. However, I was a bit amazed I'd seen a full body apparition since those are supposedly rare. So perhaps it was the uniqueness of my sighting and the fact that, at the time, my husband was a bit of a skeptic that made me decide to keep things to myself. While OG. The overcoat guy, my nickname for the ghost since he both wore an overcoat and looked kind of like an old time gangster, appeared to me a few more times. I never mentioned it, considering him my spooky pal arisen from the building's past. In fact, feeling as though he might have been one of the down and outers who died on his dollar a night makeshift bed. My heart went out to him. I felt pity for the guy. I tell you this to make it clear that OG wasn't the reason life in the former apartment hotel eventually began to pall. That could be blamed on a number of things. The acquisition of an upstairs neighbor who rolled what sounded like bowling balls across her rugless floors at 2 a.m. Plumbing problems in the form of a shower that didn't drain and a sink that regularly threw up black water that the building's inept. Maintenance crews seemed unable to fix, and the loud mechanical screeches now regularly emitted by the funky old elevator, suggesting it had gone out of alignment. Very simply, the time had come to move, so we found another apartment, and life went on. Then one day, out of the blue, my husband said, I'm really glad we moved out of the old place, because sometimes I used to see a guy standing behind me at the kitchen sink. I didn't tell you because I didn't want you to be scared, but I think he was a ghost. Really? I said, genuinely surprised by his admission that such things might exist. Then, curious as to whether it was OG or someone else he'd seen, I asked, can you describe him? Oh, sure, he said. I saw him often enough. He was about medium height, wearing a big wool coat and a Humphrey Bogart hat pulled down. There was no face that I could see, and he never stayed for more than a few seconds. Obviously, it was time to confess that I'd also seen Overcoat Guy. To allay any lingering fears my husband might have had over what he'd seen, I explained there wasn't anything to be scared of, really, and that our roommate was probably just confused about what had happened to him. My feelings always been that, having contracted pneumonia, he laid down on his mattress one night, wrapped in his overcoat and died in his sleep. But why he was wearing a hat and using it to hide his face remains a mystery. What I did not know at the time was that my sympathy for overcoat guy might found us in some way. For not only did he eventually become fodder for a novel I'm still trying to write, I think I saw him again in broad daylight on the front steps of the house I now own. But that's a story for another time. When I was in my first year out of school, my older brother and I moved into a small two-story apartment in Scarborough, Western Australia. It was relatively cheap and in a great location, with the only drawback being that the apartment seemed half-finished in places. There were quite a few outdoor areas that were crumbling away, and even some of the walls in the upstairs area had sections of the wall unpainted. We were apparently the first tenants since the renovation. Our parents would come and stay with us from time to time, and we still talk about our weird experiences in that place today. It always had an eerie feeling to it, with random rooms at odd angles and a very uncomfortable aurea, for want of a better word. The biggest feeling I had at the time was that I always felt like I was going to look down the staircase from the top living area and see someone run past. I don't know why I even thought that, but my parents said it was one of the first things that I said to them about the place. It all started one Friday night when I was staying home with my mom. We were both sitting on the couch watching TV at about 9 p.m. with only the lampshade and a kitchen light on. We both felt something really odd that I've never felt before or since like all of the air was getting sucked out of the room, or there was a pressure change or something similar. We felt like we couldn't move, and it was like we were stuck in place. A shadow then appeared on the wall to the back left of the TV, about the size of a small person, 
but almost just looking like a blob in the vague shape of a human. It moved diagonally up the wall to the left, as if it were climbing a set of stairs. It then disappeared, and we spent the rest of the night in hysterics, leaving the house until my brother and dad returned a few hours later. What must have been a few weekends later, another encounter occurred. I had just been at the cinema, watching a film with some friends. The film was White Noise, around 2005, and was based on hearing ghosts speak to you through the static of an untuned radio. It was a pretty average movie with an interesting idea. That night, while I was asleep in bed, my clock radio turned on at max volume right next to my head at about 1 am. It was 10 seconds of chaos as I tried to turn off the radio alarm, but nothing was turning off the sound. In my half-asleep state, I didn't think to pull it out of the wall. After about 10 seconds, it finally turned off. I somehow went back to sleep, but I remember at the time knowing that it was the scariest thing that had ever happened to me, and that I had just encountered something. The next morning, I woke up to find the cord for the alarm clock in the middle of the room, under my bed, nowhere near the wall. Not long after that encounter, we had some friends around for some drinks in our main living room and had another incident. An old CD player of my brother's was sitting on the table and turned on max volume all of a sudden, playing weird Indian sitar sounding music. Needless to say, it scared the hell out of everyone in the room, if not only because of the loud noise out of nowhere. At another point during the night, the sound of a girl screaming came from upstairs and was eventually explained away by one of my friends as coming from a neighbor's house, even though it felt like it was directly above us. Another instance occurred on an evening when my mom was staying with us and my brother and dad were away. We had a table tennis table in our garage that was connected to the house through the laundry. I had fallen asleep on the couch and woke up at about 2 a.m. I went to the laundry to get a drink of water from the tap and could hear people playing table tennis beyond the door to the garage. I was basically frozen in fear. I put my ear right up to the door and could hear the sounds of a game being played. But I knew that myself and my mom were the only ones in the apartment. I retreated and went to bed, knowing that I was too weak to open the door and confront whatever was in there. I somehow fell asleep. The next morning, I woke up and went downstairs for breakfast. The first thing mom says to me is, how late were you and your friends up playing table tennis last night? I got up to go to the toilet at 3 a.m. and could hear a game going on in there. So that was pretty spine tingling. The last story that I can think of at the moment is when I was at a friend's house one night and received a phone call from my brother at home. As I answered, he said, how drunk are you? I can hear you rattling the keys in the door. I explained that I was at a friend's house to which he replied, shit, and hung up. He called me back five minutes later and explained that as soon as he hung up, he heard what sounded like a large animal run along the side of the house from the front, along the side fence, and within seconds, within seconds, within seconds, was knocking aggressively at the back door. He went to the back door and there was nothing there. Sorry for the wall of text but I just felt like I needed to get those stories of that apartment written down. I'm sure there are other instances that we experienced, but that's all I can remember at the moment. Does anyone have any ideas as to what we were dealing with there? This happens in Bowie, Maryland, near Belair Mansion. I was nine, and this happened in 1991. I was in the fourth grade and on the safety patrol for Tulip Grove Elementary. I had lived in the area for only a year at this point and knew of the rumors that the mansion was haunted. The grounds around the mansion, not so much. My patrol post was on Tapered Lane, which was close to the mansion. My responsibility as a safety patrol was simple cross kids going across tapered lane, make sure they were behaving themselves and tell kids to get off the grass of people's homes. The mansion and my patrol post were both on a hill. The mansion was across the street from my post on Tulip Grove Drive, which was a more major road than tapered. In the mornings, 
I crossed kids going from the direction of Belair Drive that were headed to the school. In the afternoons, I crossed them, going vice versa. My experience was in the morning. It was sunny. A group of students arrives to be crossed. I hold out my arms as if trying to make AT with my body. I look to the right where Tapered continues. I look to the left where Tulip Grove Drive is. I look behind me in the direction of the mansion in Belair Drive. All of this is to make sure no cars are coming before crossing the street. I look ahead of me just to make sure no cars are coming up from the direction of the school. I see a kid about my age scurrying up the hill. It was on the property of the house that was on the corner of Tapered Lane. He had brown hair and blue eyes. Considering I have always been short, even then, I assumed he was slightly taller than me. He had freckles. He wore a shirt that resembled a sailor's uniform and had navy shorts on, then had navy shorts on that went nearly to his knees. He was on the grass in someone's yard. As I crossed the street, since all the roads were clear of cars, I yelled at the kid to get off the grass. He vanished before I was done saying, get off the grass. I was perplexed. Did he just vanish in front of me? Nah. There was a big shrubbery on the corner of the yard of this house. I normally place my backpack in front of it when I'm patrolling that area in the afternoon. I looked behind me to make sure there weren't any kids coming, and I crossed tapered lane to look behind the shrub. My thought was, he ducked behind the shrub, though I thought Bush at the time, to avoid me yelling at him. I checked behind the shrub. He wasn't there, huh? The next thought I had was that he decided to run down the hill towards the school to avoid me reprimanding him. So I looked down the hill where I could see the kids I just crossed. However, I couldn't see him. I didn't see anyone running. And the thing is, this kid would have stood out because it was still too cool to wear shorts. Everyone was still wearing jackets and pants. Hummy. I went back across tapered and pondered. I didn't see him with the kids I just crossed or even running ahead of them. I didn't see him behind the shrub. I didn't see him cross Tulip Grove. Or he really would have gotten in trouble. We did have a crossing guard down there to cross kids across that street. He didn't come up my way as I was crossing the kids. He didn't go down tapered. However, my mind kept pointing out. You saw him vanish as he was going up the small hill on that person's lawn. My rational mind kept saying there is no way someone would vanish into thin air. Here's the thing, and it's something I have struggled to come to terms with for 32 years now. I saw this boy in full frontal view. I didn't see this out of the corner of my eye. He was solid. He wasn't see-through. I literally saw a solid looking being vanish in front of me in full frontal view. And even after all this time, I don't know how to process that. Now, being into history, I learned that his attire was from the Victorian era. I also purchased a book that talked about the history of the mansion and the surrounding area. So I was hoping to pinpoint who I saw may have been or what accidents in the area would have happened. I was aware of some deaths. Unfortunately, the records of people living at the mansion between the time the Taskers and the Woodwards lived there weren't kept well. So I still have no clue who that boy could have been. This experience didn't scare me. It just made me go, what the, a lot, and still does. I think if anyone saw a fully solid person vanish right in front of them, they would feel the same way.